At that time, Jesus said to the disciples, there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations. By reason of the confusion of the roaring of the sea and of the waves, men withering away for fear and expectation of what shall come upon the whole world. Words taken from St. Luke's Holy Gospel in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. St. Rose of Viterbo was born in the 13th century, what we call the Age of Faith. St. Rose of Viterbo demonstrated signs of extraordinary holiness even when she was just a baby. At the age of three years old, for example, St. Rose raised a relative from the dead through her powerful prayers to the Most High. More specifically, one of her aunts had died. The family was standing over the coffin weeping aloud. Deeply moved by the sorrow of her relatives, St. Little Rose went to the coffin, raised her eyes to heaven, and prayed silently. And she placed her little hand upon the body of her aunt and called her out by name. The dead woman immediately rose from the dead, opened her eyes, and reached out to embrace her little niece who had raised her to life once again. From her earliest years, she gave herself over to prayer and penance for the conversion of sinners. And at only seven years old, St. Rose of Viterbo began to live a life of prayerful solitude within a tiny room in her parents' home. And as a young girl, Rose even converted a witch to the true faith by a miracle. The sorceress was hurting people in another village with her spells and curses. And so St. Rose asked that a large pile of logs be set on fire. Rose then stood amidst the flames of the bonfire for three hours without any harm being done to her body. The witch fell prostrate before Rose, renounced the devil, and accepted our dearest Lord. Rose became very ill during her youth, but Our Lady appeared to her in a dream and cured her. Rose was then instructed by the Mother of God to be clothed in the habit of St. Francis, uh, the Third Order Franciscans. But instead of going off to some convent, Rose was to remain at home to be a good example to her neighbors. And shortly afterwards, our dearest Lord appeared to Rose while he hung upon a cross. He was wearing a crown of thorns, and his head was bleeding profusely. St. Rose, aghast at this sight and so much blood, cried out, O oh my Lord, what has reduced thee to such a state? Our Lord replied, My love, my deep love for men has done this. But then Rose asked her Savior, Who has so pierced and torn thee? The sins of men have done it, our dearest Lord answered. Sin. Sin, cried the saint, and she began to scourge herself to make atonement for the sins of the world. And by divine inspiration, Rose then took a cross in her hand and went up and down the streets and public squares of her city of Viterbo, telling people of the terrible tortures our Lord suffered and the horror of human sin. At 15 years old, she sought admittance to the poor Clare nuns, but was turned away for lack of a proper dowry. Humbly submitting to this decision, she foretold her admission to the convent after her death. And two years later, at only 17 years old, St. Rose of Viterbo passed to her eternal reward and would eventually be buried in the chapel of the actual poor Clare monastery that had rejected her, thus fulfilling her prophecy. Her body is now in a glass case, a glass sarcophagus. And although the exterior skin of the corpse is quite darkened, the body is still flexible and the interior organs show no or little sign of decay, although the body is nearly 800 years old. Now, there is one incident in St. Rose's life, however, that made her very, very famous, even a hero of the 13th century. And that was her courageous stand against the evil emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, namely Frederick II, also known as Frederick the Great. He was a hero to Hitler later on. Viterbo 
St. Rose's hometown, had decided to rebel against the Pope and allowed itself to be occupied and, yes, ruled by this evil emperor. Frederick was at war with the papacy, and he had sworn to conquer all the papal states. And so inspired by divine providence, Rose would come out of her prayerful seclusion in her home at only 15, and she would preach in the streets and public squares of her city. And St. Rose urged the citizens of Viterbo to be faithful to the authority of the Holy Father. At the same time, St. Rose condemned those who sided with the evil emperor. And for two years, this little girl preached conversion to her fellow citizens. And her ardent words were often accompanied by special wonders that would stun the crowd. The stone, for example, upon which she stood and preached would rise up off the ground and would sustain her in midair for hours as she spoke. And eventually St. Rose and her family would be exiled from their own hometown because of many enemies they had gained. St. Rose then predicted that Frederick the Great would soon die, and her prophecy came true one week later. Now, in today's Holy Gospel, our dearest Lord speaks about the end of the world. He speaks about the end times and the signs that will accompany the last days. And according to Holy Church, one of the signs that the end is very near will be the rise of an individual that is known as the Antichrist. He will be a man of sin. He will be a lawless individual. He will be a son of loss, a son of perdition. According to Pope Gregory the Ninth of Holy Memory, Frederick the Great was a preambulus antichristi, or in English, Frederick was a foreshadowing, a prefigurement of the Antichrist that would come. See, Frederick had some of those traits that would be present in the Antichrist. He was extremely intelligent in the worldly sense, enlightened more by the occult than by divine revelation. He was fluent in as many as nine languages in the 13th century, including the language of Arabic. He was said to have a mind of a modern scientist, the heart of a romantic poet, and the iron will of a tyrant. No wonder the liberal elites at that time called him the stupor mundi, the wonder of the world. Frederick the Great had also issued an official proclamation that Christ our Lord and Holy Moses were both impostors, and that he, the emperor, was truly a Messiah-like figure. He would attack the papal states, he would disrespect the Pope, and he would imprison many, many priests. Frederick was considered many things at his time, an Islamic sympathizer, a heretic, an apostate with the spirit of the Antichrist. He would be excommunicated twice during his evil reign. And while in the Holy Land, Frederick the Great was greatly respected by Muslim leaders, not only for his ability to speak and write fluent Arabic, but also because of his seeming desire to become a Muslim. According to Muslim chronicles, Frederick left a lasting impression of a man who was more inclined to Eastern Muslim things to Latin Western things. And sounding like our own president today, Frederick stated, My chief aim in passing the night while I was in Jerusalem was to hear the call to prayer given by the Muslims and their cries of praise to Allah during the night. In reality, however, Frederick seems to have been neither a real Christian nor a Muslim sympathizer or an atheist. He was rather a religious pluralist. Every religion is the same. It doesn't really matter. Taking what he liked from religion and philosophy and discarding the rest. A cafeteria Catholic in some ways. He was also a skeptic who doubted even the true faith. His mockery of Christian practices was well known at the time. He had a deep interest in astrology and the occult and alchemy. And he was a true Epicurean who loved sensual pleasures. He wanted to fill every appetite to the fullest. Again, he was the preambulus antichristi, the prefigurement of the Antichrist to come. 
And yet, our Lord is good. Because on his very deathbed, Frederick wore an undyed wool tunic of a Cistercian monk. It seems that his skepticism was apparently losing out to a serious concern for his immortal soul. For without Christ, one cannot be saved. Finally, before the second coming of Christ, before that fiery conflagration spoken of the scriptures, which will engulf the entire universe in flames, bringing forth the new heavens and a new earth. Before this time, there will be the last days and the rise of a true, full Antichrist, a man who will be the perfection of all the evil men that have come before him. Antiochus, the Emperor Nero, the Emperor Caligula, Muhammad, Mao Zedong, Martin Luther, Joseph Smith, Stalin, all of those men who preached a demonic gospel with themselves being a worldly Messiah. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, a father and doctor of Holy Church, adds that, quote, the Antichrist will exceed in malice, perversity, lust, and wickedness, in piety and ruthlessness and barbarity, all men that have ever disgraced human nature. It will be as if Satan himself came to the earth and assumed human flesh. It is quite clear from sacred scriptures, sacred tradition, and private revelation that the Antichrist will come after a certain time of peace when things seem really good. The Antichrist will be a human being, a particular individual man, not just an ideology, not just a system. And because he will pass himself off as the Messiah longed for by the Jews, the Antichrist will most likely be a Jew, or at least someone who the Jewish people accept completely. For they have always longed to have a new order to replace the old Christian order. Another saintly theologian wrote of the Antichrist the following, saying, quote, This impious man will give orders that he himself shall be worshipped as God. For he will say he is Christ, though he will actually be Christ's enemy. That he may be believed, he will receive the power, important thing here, he will receive the power of doing wonders, so that fire may descend from the heavens, the sun retire from its course, and the image or idol which he sets up may speak and by such wonders he shall entice many people to worship him and to receive his sign on their hands and foreheads. And he who shall not worship the Antichrist shall receive death and refined tortures. To summarize then, the Antichrist will gain followers by being a powerful imposter, using every false interpretation of scripture to portray himself as a savior. He will work magic, not actual miracles. He will demand worship, and he will hand out many gifts to his followers, but he will inflict death upon those who resist him even in the slightest way. But there is one final thing I must add. There will be a powerful, albeit small group of people that will resist. In other words, there will be a remnant that will imitate St. Rose of Viterbo. The greatest opposition to the Antichrist, in fact, will come from the preaching of Old Testament saints, namely Enoch, mentioned in the book of Genesis, and the prophet Elijah, mentioned in the book of Kings. Enoch and Elijah, you should look them up. Enoch and Elijah, whom the Holy Bible clearly states, never died a bodily death. Enoch was assumed into heaven, Genesis tells us. And, of course, Elijah went up in a fiery, fiery chariot. At this time, Enoch and Elijah are presently hidden from our view as they await the last days. And when those last days come, the two holy men will come out of their hiding and they will preach against the Antichrist and many will go away from the Antichrist. The Antichrist will soon perceive that he is being damaged by these men of God. And they will see the mass conversion of the Jewish people to the Catholic faith. 
The man of sin will then march towards Jerusalem in order to prove that he is the Messiah and God. And the Antichrist will kill Enoch and Elijah, the book of Revelation clearly states. And he will leave them unburied on a city street in Jerusalem. But after three and a half days, these two men of God will be resurrected and will ascend to heaven on a cloud in the presence of their very enemy. And this miraculous event will actually confuse the Antichrist. In other words, the nations will begin to wonder if he truly is the Messiah. The Antichrist will then magically lift himself up with great majesty to Mount Olivet, the very mountain upon which our Lord ascended into glory. And tradition says that he will prove himself or try to prove himself by ascending upwards towards the skies. But at this moment, as the Bible records, Christ, the Son of God and Son of Mary, will strike down the great imposter. We have begun the holy season of Advent. And since we have just ended the church year and are beginning a new church year, it is appropriate to consider the end times and the last days of those end times. As we see from the life of St. Rose of Viterbo and the evil example of Frederick the Great, the spirit of Antichrist is always present. In fact, this evil spirit of rebellion against the Most High is especially present among us today. The time of his coming is not actually known. But until that time, let us resist at least the same false spirit that was resisted by St. Rose of their parable. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.